want you all to imagine with me a place where leaders in business, community organizations, and social service agencies all work together on a shared platform for the improvement of their local communities. How awesome would that be? See, if you think about it, just in a small sized city like our beloved Greenville, you can drive down the boulevard in, in our business district and see hundreds on top of hundreds of mainstream business firms. And if you think about it, they all have a CEO or some chief staff that sits at the top and, and they're skilled at solving complex organizational problems and driving results. But what if all of those minds were working on one community platform within their own respective roles to drive and, and create better communities? Again, how awesome would that be? And why doesn't that happen? Well, my name is Jermaine McNair again. I'm the founding director of NC Civil, a local nonprofit here in Greenville, North Carolina, that works to build a shared platform where community members and community resource providers can come together, meet, and exchange values, and work together for improved communities. And I'm here today to share with you my journey, the lessons that I've learned along the way, and to implore you to build upon those lessons in your own work and in your own communities. My journey starts off in a United States federal prison. Now I know most of the time if a person finds themselves there, that means their journey has just ended, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but for me, having grown up in low-income, marginalized communities throughout my life. Going there was actually my introduction to the larger social system. And when I arrived there, the first thing I noticed was that there were, I mean, there were 1,500 other inmates there. And they all were just like me. I mean, really, just like me. They, most of them were black, most of them we wore very similar hairstyles, we talked the same slang, we walked the same. When, you, when, when we began to talk to each other, our stories were the same, our backgrounds the same, our family structure, or, or lack thereof, it, it was all the same. And up to that point, you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta realize, I thought of my life as being this very unique thing. I mean, when you grow up in, you know, one of the essences of a, live, growing up in a marginalized community is that you learn to live outside of the graces of, you know, common social circles. You learn to make your own way. And even when I was in middle school and high school, I knew that I was doing things that the other kids in school were probably not doing. So I thought of myself as a bit of a rebel, someone who did not fit into the system. But then I got there and I'm looking at all these people and I, I'm realizing that, whoa, according to what I'm seeing, I mean, there were people there from New York, New Jersey, D.C., Chicago, Detroit, Ohio, Maryland, Virginia, uh, Texas, Florida, Georgia. Uh, Las Vegas and Cali, they were all there. And according to what I was seeing, every city in America had an inner city that was apparently filled with black and brown families that were all having their lives structured by a particular set of parameters that was driving the outcomes in their lives. It was a system, there was a larger system happening. I mean, how could the same thing be happening in every single city across America? All of a sudden, I didn't see myself as being so unique. I was a caricature. Worse than the disappointment 
of being sentenced and convicted and sent away from your home and family was the disappointment in myself of knowing that I had allowed my life to slip inside of this age-old narrative of black boys in low-income communities, and I didn't even see it coming. But it was cool, I said, you know, you know, the first 20 some odd years of my life, that's on me, joke's on me. But from here on out, I decided that I would take steps that were necessary to simply open my life up to the greater possibilities. Because you see, up to that point, obviously, I had received all of my images, all of my messages and ideas from the same enclosed community. So opening my life up was my number one priority. Now, what does this have to do with nonprofit organizing and community development? I'll tell you guys, for all of my leaders in, the, in, in this room here, and, and leaders everywhere, I will argue to you that the issue in low-income communities is not the lack of resources or the lack of programs and initiatives. To actually explain to you the problem, I want to use uh, coding to explain this. And I guess I should, I guess I'll get back to my story to then explain why someone who is not a coder is even talking about coding. <laughs> but um, I, I began to just look at the system when I was there and I began to study and read and learn about what was taking shape around me. And um, just a few quick lessons. I learned that the most powerful thing in our society was exchange. People think it's money, people think it's so many other things. But one of the principles that I learned, and I want you guys to really catch this, because power is what a lot of this is about. But one of the most powerful things is exchange. And I'll tell you how I learned this. Um, when you look at the dollar value, they say the dollar value is weak or the dollar value is strong. What they're saying is that $1 or $10 or $100, people are exchanging at a rate that means that one $10 bill is being responsible for facilitating five different exchanges or 10 different exchanges. And when the economy slows, a $10 bill will sit still and it won't move from one person to the next. Now when it's not moving, it's still the same $10 bill, but it's valued less because, the, because of the system that it exists in. Now remember, remember, I'm still thinking about systems. I'm still thinking about the community that I came from and I'm looking at how it was enclosed and marginalized from the rest of society. And I said, man, we don't need more money because remember, we, many of us in poor communities were taught to do, above all things, go and get money. And as a young person, I ran and I got it and I filled my pockets with it. And for some reason, there were people next to me all around me who had less money than I had, but they had a better life somehow. So I realized that money wasn't the thing, it was the system that it was involved in. And that system needed to open up and flow. And in our community, there was nothing flowing in and nothing flowing out because there were no relationships flowing in and out. We were all kind of guarded and defensive because of many of our past experiences. And we developed a lifestyle and a culture that basically rejected the society that apparently had rejected us. So it was kind of like, the Berlin Wall around our communities. Nothing was coming in and nothing was coming out, and that was hurting us. So again, my goal was to first open myself up, step out, and then create new avenues and pathways for myself, for my child, and for my community. I made it through that period, and I returned home, and my brother was doing very well as a computer programmer and he began to teach me tools that I could use to kind of get my life going again. And using some of the tools that he had taught me, I built my first web blog and began to do 
affiliate marketing for mobile devices and things. I mean, it was, it was at the height of the mobile device smartphone craze. And the Apple wars, the Apple, <laughs> the phone wars had kind of were in their first stages. At the time, Apple's primary draw wasn't even the iPhone. More people had an iPod than the actual iPhone, if you remember. Their big draw was their iTunes music. But Android was this amazing platform that the tech world was going crazy over. But the thing about Android was that Android wasn't even about a phone. It was about the platform that would invite developers to build on it and that platform would be the platform that all phones would use to develop on. So it's very different. When you go buy an Apple product, the only, in fact, the only way you can access an Apple product is by purchasing an Apple licensed product. But to get Android platform, you can basically buy any phone out there. Samsung can make it, LG can make it. And that's the very opposite of what traditionally had been done. The, the traditional method was what we call proprietary. Proprietary is not just about making money. Proprietary is about owning the rights to whatever is taking place. But this open source thing was this platform where they wrote the code and they shared it. So you had developers in Japan, China, in Europe, and everywhere building off of this code and adding improvements to it and then sharing those improvements in a larger community. The exchange that took place on this Android platform would be the wave of everything that we would come to know. So how does this relate to nonprofits and community development? So again, I come back and I begin to, I launched NC Civil. And the civil in NC Civil stands for, it's long stuff. It stands for, whoo, deep breath. Community and Industry Values Interactionist League. It's the Community and Industry Values Interactionist League. And it's based on the principle that communities and industries both have very separate cultures and they don't mix well. Industry follows skill patterns, market patterns, traffic patterns even. There was, there was a term in the real estate course I was taking where they teach you a very similar principle to what they teach you in business courses. They teach you the three rules are location, 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 absolutely. What that meant was that where you placed your business was a major determinant in the success of your business. And you needed to follow parameters. They, they taught you to follow the highways. Wherever they are expanding highways, that's where you want to place your business or purchase your real estate. Wherever there's new development and new homes popping up, that's where the disposable income is going. That's where you want to place your business. They even have a rule that says follow the Walmart. Literally. <laughs> literally. I, I was literally taught that Walmart spends so much money in research before they put a Walmart anywhere that if you see a Walmart coming up, save your research dollars, just go there because they've done it right. This, and I, it blew my mind. But what that meant was that there were so many determinants dictating where business and the finances went. And remember this currency that's moving. There were so many other determinants dictating that, that in our lifetime, the money would never flow back to these inner city communities. It would continue to go out and further and further out. And I remember growing up seeing grandmas, aunties, and moms, and dads praying for the day that their communities would get better and the resources and the good times would flow back to the, to the old days. And what they didn't realize is that according to our market trends, it was never coming back. So the only thing that was flowing resources into our community were the nonprofit groups and possibly the churches. But here's what their model was. Nonprofit organizations built their programs on their own platforms, much like Apple. It was very proprietary. 
if, if, if I build a traditional nonprofit program and you guys are my target population, I may channel my services towards you guys, but in order for you to get access to those services, you've got to come here. And you need to be here at 9 o'clock in the morning and meet these guidelines and, and work yourself into our institutional culture in order for you to gain access to these resources. And even if I do a great job at it, it's you guys, not them. How much expanding can I do on a program? I mean, the biggest thing I can do with a nonprofit program is probably build an institutional or a school. It's still going to be closed off. It won't affect and impact the community. So I said, what I wanted to be was not a traditional nonprofit group. I wanted to be a platform. And I wanted to be a platform that when I went into the community and connected with my target audience, I had tentacles and pathways and relationships and connections that connected to the outside world that potentially would never come through here. And we would be the conduit of exchange that would increase the value of whatever was happening in here and whatever was happening over here, we would increase the exchange rate. And that's all we set to do. I literally moved back to Greenville in 2011. I began partnering up with groups. Uh, we partnered first with businesses. I remember working with about 15 businesses on my first venture. And we hosted charity sporting tournaments with local businesses in Greenville. And it brought all the businesses out and it helped us to establish a rapport and relationships with our local business community because I knew, again, I can't run into a community, into a burning building to save everybody and when I get there, well, I'm the answer for everybody? <laughs> no, I better be connected to some other institutions, right? So I, I did it backwards. I came into Greenville and I did not run into the community that I so solely wanted to help. I went to the other communities, <clears throat> built those relationships. From those charity tournaments, we garnered attention. I leveraged that attention into partnering with other nonprofits and other charities. And then the platform expanded more. And then local government and local politicians took notice. And I embraced their agenda and their desire to connect with communities and begin to write and expand the platform to include them. And then you know whenever local politicians jump on board, then the media jumps on board. And then I, I learned an appreciation of how media can help get the word out about community programs. So now our media department wasn't a, our media department, it was the community's media. Our, our, our government and policy wasn't our department, it was working with government. The, the parameters that we use for our program models, we borrowed from the Greenville Police Department, whatever their crime zone areas were. That was what we set for our parameters. And you have to understand how this threatens proprietary control because again, I'm not saying that nonprofits and community organizations are proprietary in the sense that they're only doing it for the money. What I'm saying is that for the survival of nonprofit groups, they need to be able to control inputs and outcomes and be able to clearly state what their results are. Because remember, that's how they appeal to their funding sources and their supporters. So now, back to coding. To further explain this, uh, coding is computer programming, for anyone who doesn't know. Computer programming is a three-way relationship between a program developer and a computer. They manage that relationship with their code. That code allows the computer to carry out instructions and commands for the program that's set to run on it. It's a three-way relationship. Now, in the nonprofit world, that three-way relationship seems to be still the program is present, still the program that they're designing is present, but what they consider to be their computer is their funding sources. That's a three-way relationship for your traditional nonprofit community organization. And then the community is a beneficiary of that, but it's not a part of the three-way relationship. What I needed was the community to be the third party in this three-way relationship. We would develop programs. So we would have our developer, we would have our programs, 
But who we designed and appealed to would be the community. And the community would be the platform that we would develop on. And it would be open source. Now again, at the time, going into this, I wasn't calling it open source. I just knew the relationships of exchange were the most important thing. There were times when larger agencies have come to me and said, hey, we've got money for you. We see what you're doing, we've got money for you. And I would tell them, I could do it. Lord knows I could do a lot with your money. I've done more with less. But if you're going to send money and you're not going to be involved with the relationship, keep it. Because what we need is engagement. High level, hyperactivity engagement to a community that's been cut off. So I began to build those partnerships. And you guys got to understand what it means to have a nonprofit to run it for three years and partner up with all the different organizations and be noticed around the community and have a little notoriety and have yet to run a single program. Hadn't helped essentially one kid. And I held fast to the idea that when I finally got there, those relationships would be key. So we finally decided after three years of being a roving organization, people saw us partnering up here and there and everywhere, and they would ask, what in the world do you do? yet to be seen. Well, we finally decided that it was time to purchase and rent our, our outreach office. And the goal behind opening up our outreach office right here in West Greenville was to take those partnerships and now bring them on home. And we would focus on what we did best. We would focus on ways that we could keep these relationships moving between the community residents, allowing them to connect to community resources, and thinking about now what's our functional role in this three-part relationship still. And we decided it was outreach. We didn't focus on criminal diversion. We didn't focus on low-income housing. We didn't focus on education or health care. We didn't. Strange stuff. We focused on outreach because if we could take our presence and all of our partnerships and now go out into the community and weave our presence through the community into their daily lives. My goal was that when a person walked outside of their door and went to the store to get their drink of choice, my goal is that they shouldn't be able to make it to the store without coming in contact with some resources somewhere. And whatever window or door they use to connect through those resources, that window or door should connect to everyone. That window or door should connect to other resources. So we literally ran outreach programs into our communities and still do, but when we go out, we work on behalf of every agency. No proprietary control. You'll see NC Civil, and with our Westgate project, sending teams of street kids into the communities, knocking on doors, delivering information, but they're delivering the messaging on behalf of not only NC Civil, but every partnering organization that shares our platform. So the question, who do, who do the results belong to? How do funders identify who's doing the work? I don't know. But it doesn't matter to me. Because the one thing that I firmly believe in is that more important than having a, a program or a nonprofit that grows greater and greater is having a community that grows greater and greater. And I, I literally just said this to another nonprofit partner the other day. If we, as nonprofits, businesses, and, and social service agencies, don't function like a community, if we don't model the behaviors of a community, how do we expect those we intended to serve to function more like a community? Because truth be told, if they became more of a community and their exchange rate increased, Whatever things they have that we consider to not be valuable, if the rate of exchange just increased and everybody was contributing to the one platform, the value of it would rise. So what we want to do is get, stop looking at the world through our organizational lenses. Because remember, all those bankers that are sitting at the top of the bank and all those chief, chief uh, C-suite executives that are sitting at the top of their businesses, I'll tell you, in their defense, they're all taught to see the world through their organizational lens. If it rains, it's not raining on the community. It, the rain is going to affect our business patterns today. 
And that's their job, to monitor and control the operations within their space. It's proprietary. So every time I sit down with a leader, and I enjoy spending time with leaders because I know that that's the minds that I have to change. It's not really trying to change the minds of our, the, the members of our low-income communities. It's changing the mindsets of our leaders. And every time I sit down with another leader, my, my task at that table is to get them to start to, to stop looking at the world through their organizational lens. Stop looking at the world for how it engages within on their platform and start considering how their business and organization is engaging in the world and in our community. And if we can weave the fabric of community and weave the fabric of exchange through our local neighborhoods, won't the resources move naturally? Won't the Berlin Wall come down and the resources start to move? We don't know who will get credit for it. But it also, it also reduces overlap. Every agency I work with has about the same basic five programs, and, every, and, and it's necessary because it's hard to deliver one service without having other support services. So this is not a tout. It's necessary. But, you know, quickly, I was at a mechanic. I was at my, I was at my mechanic last week, and he said, hey, Jay, how's, how's everything going out there? And I said, man, the, the community development game is tough because it's not like a car. When something malfunctions on your car, because all the parts have to work together, you immediately recognize it because the car functions a little worse. But in the community, the parts are so separate that any of them can be not working at any given time. And because they're not tied to one collective platform, you don't know what's working and what's not. So if you can get things on one platform and that platform be the community platform and we share that space, we all become accountable to one another as leaders and as organizational developers. And we all can reduce overlap. We can then have a conversation about what I can do that serves you because serving you allows me to serve them and serving them in turn again allows me to serve you and we keep this relationship going and we continue to collaborate and improve on one another's ideas so that we can continue to make the best community possible. I tell my nonprofit board members all the time, I got great supporters that come to me with great ideas. And I tell them, honestly, we don't need another resource. We don't need another idea. Our job, remember, is to connect residents to resources that already exist. And if we find that there's a gap, then and only then do we design something that fills that gap. Have you, have you heard me say this before? <laughs> I say this a lot. And I've held to these core values, and I don't know where our next funding source is going to come from. I don't know who's going to own the work, but I do know this. As long as we are here engaging, working together, sharing one platform, and making that platform our community, we will not only have great organizations that grow greater and greater, but we will have a greater community. Thank you, guys.